Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, statistical image processing and in particular a type of model we have used for many different image processing tasks. But first off, I want to start by showing you an image. This is an image I took. I took it uh, last summer with my Nokia Lumia phone. So just uh, take a look at it for a few seconds. And then uh, I will explain to you how this image was taken. So in a very simplified 10 second view on a digital camera, you can imagine a point in the world that either emits or reflects light. It's projected through an optical system onto a sensor, and then the sensor produces some digital signal which is somehow processed, okay? As simple as that. However, it's not really that simple. So this is a visualization of a, of a real optical system that you would see in a, a digital camera. The, uh, in a smartphone, it's probably a little bit simpler. It only has six lenses of different materials, different optical properties. So it's a highly designed system uh, designed to trade off different factors of optical qualities, of weight, of uh, cost, uh, of form factor, of all the uh, robustness um, of being able to stabilize in terms of uh, motion compensation. Um, so it's a, it's a difficult system to design. Same for the sensor. Uh, it's, it's one of the very important uh, applications of semiconductors, is imaging sensors. They keep getting smaller, they keep getting more involved, there's more and more processing happening closer to the signal. So a typical sensor in a smartphone would look like this. It would have a small micro lens, a color filter that filters a certain spectrum of wavelengths, which is projected, and these photons which, which hit the surface here are converted with very high efficiencies, up to 90% into electrons. This is sort of the state of the art in, in sensor technology. And then we have the imaging, uh, imaging pipeline, right? So you get a signal which is actually monochrome, but it's filtered with a color filter array, typically a Bayer filter, and it undergoes a, a sequence of transformations, each of which is carefully tuned, carefully calibrated to the optical system. And, and only if all these things work together, you get an image like that. So this image, probably in the darker regions here, has something on the order of 50 to 150 photons per second hitting a pixel. Okay, and you try to get a signal from that. That image was taken in a tenth of a second, so 100 milliseconds. So we are speaking here about counting single photons for each pixel. And only if all these components work together, the optical system, the sensor, um, this is a, in, in this phone, this actually a, the lens system is stabilized. It's in a small barrel, so it's suspended. It can actually compensate for optical shake. And then there's a digital processing pipeline, and only if all of these systems work together, highly integrated, tuned, for each other, then you can take a picture like that, handheld. Okay, so that's sort of the motivation why I'm interested in statistical image processing, how to, how to keep pushing the boundary of images we can take. But I have one component I would like to talk about in this simplistic view. Uh, what about the world, right? As a, if we think about probabilistic models, about generative models, we surely care about models of the world. What is the world about? And this is really an, an interesting, um, interesting question because we, we understand the physics, we understand the world, right? We understand it so well that we can actually produce very realistically looking samples of the world. So given a high level description of a scene, we can render. This is uh, rendered using a physically accurate uh, renderer which simulates light transports through a scene. Um, we can produce realistic renderings. However, these models are not amenable to computation. Okay, so these models exist, we, we understand reality, but they're not amenable to computation. So somehow computation efficiency needs to enter our view if we want to build models for images. <laughs> And then there are more amenable models, such as, uh, say, the dead leaves model or small patch-based models uh, or the fields of experts model, generative models of images, which honestly uh, are more amenable computationally, but they don't really uh, reproduce realistic image statistics. Okay, so, and one important slide um, I want to uh, iterate here that there is a trade-off, or that it's, it's, it's a continuum between academic image processing research and sort of the real world applications of these techniques. So in academic research papers, we often make up a model problem, which is simplified with strong assumptions. And then there's uh, it's a low barrier of entry for many people to contribute their research and for example, work on image denoising or something like that on a very, on a very uh, limiting assumptions. Whereas in the real world, if you talk to real image processing people who actually build these cameras, 
uh, they will tell you they are very skeptical to academic research in, in general. And there's a high barrier of entry, and your model assumptions need to be really very well validated. So they are very reluctant of making, uh, making modeling assumptions. <coughs> so there's a, a spectrum, and I will present a few works along this spectrum. So I'm not claiming I'm totally real world or totally academic, but somehow in this, I just want to show you that there is a straight off and different um, model problems could be isolated. So I'm talking about image restoration. So you're given, an, the, it's, a, it's a special task of image processing where you assume there is a true latent image which was corrupted by some process, usually stochastic, and then you observe the stochastic corruptedly image and you're interested in inferring a likely image that, that gave rise to this uh, observed image. Um, and one model which we have used for a number of tasks is what we call the regression tree field model. So uh, it's simply a combination of Gaussian conditional random fields with non-parametric regression trees. So in a sense, a simple bird's eye view is you have, some, you have some pixel, you evaluate some filter statistics, for example, what's the mean intensity in a certain rectangle around this pixel, so here and here you evaluate it. And depending on that intensity, you traverse a tree down, and at the leaf of the tree, you store some model parameters. You do this at every place in the image, and you piece together one coherent model, in this case a Gaussian, a single huge multivariate Gaussian for the whole image, and then you do inference in that Gaussian. So it's very efficient at test time. So as a representation, we simply use a sort of a, a homogeneous structure, so we just replicate the same type of factors. But because these factors evaluate the image content, the actual effective interaction that's instantiated in this factor graph differs from image to image. So something very natural that you can express, for example, if there is an edge along a certain direction, the factor can recognize this and then sort of smooth only along this direction. For example, this is the kind of interaction you can express with this type of model. Uh, okay, so technically it's just a big, huge, quadratic, uh, positive definite function. And you can, um, so you have a, a quadratic component here, which must be positive definite. You have a linear component. Uh, all these depend on filter responses, on raw pixel intensities. Uh, and they are functions of the observed image X. So There's a difference between a Markov random field and a conditional random field. The parameters are functions of the observations. Okay, so you get a single huge quadratic energy function and you can use conjugate gradients to efficiently optimize. Okay. So because a, a Gaussian conditional random field is a very limited model class, right? You get this expressive conditioning on the input image, but hey, you still only have a, a, a multivariate normal distribution, right? So um, because we have this limited model class, we use something very simple. We simply stack this model on top of each other. So the, uh, such a model would make a prediction, and then we take this prediction and the original inputs and statistics extracted from these and feed it into the same model class again. And because it's conditional and non-parametric, so it can condition on all kinds of statistics of these input observations, we can then make another prediction. And so this is a, this cascade model. It's computationally very efficient. It has an anytime property, so we can show an image every time a cascade stage is finished. and we. Uh, because each model in this cascade has the uh, ability to just reproduce its input, we get nested model classes. So we have sort of what uh, in, in, in Vapnik's philosophy is sort of this uh, increasing capacity models. Uh, so we would hope that uh, we get better and better predictive performance. Okay. Now let me skip that. We, do, you, we had different training procedures, but we ended up using empirical risk minimization because it's most efficient. Um, and we learn, okay, so we can learn with different loss functions, for example, a simple decomposable loss like the mean squared error, or we can learn with non-decomposable loss functions as long as they are differentiable. We can learn to optimize for specific loss functions. So, uh, and it actually matters, so if you optimize a model for a specific loss function with empirical risk minimization, you can expect to do better with respect to that loss function. Uh, so this one is optimized for another loss function, otherwise the exact same model you get better predictions. So the loss function actually matters. Um, okay, let me skip about that. It's a regularization. We have an efficient way to regularize these model parameters uh, by bounding eigenvalues from above and below. We tried a lot of different other regularizers on, and, and priors on these on this, uh, positive definite matrices. Uh, and we always, I mean, I never knew, okay, how to set these 
parameters of an inverse Wishart distribution, what's a meaningful way to set these parameters, whereas bounding the eigenvalues was very easy and it directly controls the condition number of the final system that we need to solve. So it's actually also a knob on the test time efficiency. Okay, for training the trees, so Jamie has alluded to the screeny, greedy training procedure. Uh, we actually use a um, slightly clever, clever thing. So we also use a greedy training procedure in our model. Um, and remember that at every leaf in our model, we store model parameters. So say we have this, this type of model. We have model parameters, this quadratic and linear term in this quadratic form. And we compute the gradient of the empirical risk with respect to that model parameters. And because we optimize the empirical risk for our, for our current model, this gradient will be zero, right? Otherwise, we have not, we have not optimized the empirical risk. And now the question is, <coughs> um, how, can we, how can we extend that model? How can we grow the, grow the tree? And the way we do it is we just propose a random split based on the input data. So it could be uh, take a filter response at a relative position to this pixel and threshold it. And now we need to score this. This is a good possible split. This is a good way to enlarge the model. And the way we do it is we take this model parameter of the parent, we copy it to the, both, to the two leaves, and remember that the gradient at the, at the root here was, uh, at, the, at, the, at the parent was zero. But now, because we have partitioned the data, the induced gradient will no longer be zero. Right? So they will sum to zero because they've just partitioned the data, but they will no longer be zero. And we can take the uh, induced gradient norm of these new parameters, which we would get, as a, as a scoring criterion. The assumption being that if we see there's a gradient with respect to these new model parameters, we could run a few iterations of our optimization procedure to decrease the empirical risk. Okay, and the nice thing about that is actually that it's as efficient as training a normal regression tree. Um, okay, so this is a slight technical innovation, but it actually really matters in practice. So you get basically, uh, you can get the same predictive performance uh, if you train this using this functional gradient method as you would get with a normal tree trained using the squared error, squared residuals criterion. So if you use the right function to train your trees, you get better predictive performance with smaller trees. Okay, I have a little bit of time left only, but um, so this is a, we have a, a number of papers that are on this model and uh, on different applications. Let me s uh, talk quickly about these applications. So one is image denoising, a classic task. So there are many existing methods. There's a generative model, fields of experts model uh, uh, with proper Bayesian inference using MCMC, so very complicated. Uh, in terms of computationally very complicated. And then there are uh, patch-based methods, uh, locally sparse coding methods. So people, smart people, have spent their time uh, trying to, to do these um, denoising methods. Here's a result. Uh, so we compare against BM3D, which is probably the most practical real-world denoising method. Um, and let me zoom in here. So probably what you can see, this is additive white Gaussian noise, so it's not, uh, it's not 100% realistic, but you can see maybe, I don't know, that we preserve edges better than this, this method. But in terms of PS and R, it's a vis I mean, on screen you can see there's a visual improvement, and also in terms of PS and R, uh, we have a higher fidelity. And this is a standard data set. Here's a color example, again, a zoom, zoom inversion. Uh, and again, we have a better performance measure uh, by PS and R. Here are the numbers. And you can see, interestingly, that across these model stages, I told you we have this cascade model, we monotonically improve, P, uh, improve PS and R. Um, so this is just what we would hope for. We also applied it to JPEG deblocking. Probably I skip over this application. But this is an interesting non-IID noise application. And um, OK, I have five minutes left. So this is on. Um, Image deblurring, this is a big problem in smartphone photography because essentially the form factor constrains the size of the optical system and the size of the sensor. That means uh, you either have very short exposure times, no blur, but very noisy images, or you have long exposure times, no noise, but potentially blur. And if, you're, if you produce a smartphone and you want to sell it and you show noisy images to your customers, they probably think the camera is, is bad. But if you show them blurry images, they think, OK, well, of course, I shake the camera. Must be, must be me, right? So <laughs> all the vendors of smartphones, they tilt it towards having long exposure times and potentially blurry images instead of slightly more noise and sharper images. 
That's why it's a big problem. Um, we make an assumption here, which is uh, reasonably accurate for handheld devices like this and uh, scenes which are far away, which is that we have stationary blur. So we assume there is a latent image, which is sharp, which was convolved with a stationary blur kernel of big size usually, so something like 60 by 60 pixels, and this yields a blurry observation. So here are first some, uh, some numbers uh, of existing models. Uh, it turns out actually that the Bayesian model is, 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 is doing really well here. Uh, however, it takes like four minutes for, uh, I think, 128 by 128 patch, four minutes of inference time. So we can achieve the same performance in two seconds using a discriminative model. Uh, here are some results on a, on a tubing benchmark data set on deblurring. So we go from here to here. Um, and interestingly, we took as a starting point for how to build this model, we took a generative model and then just uh, replaced components of the generative model with discriminative, uh, with our discriminative uh, regression tree fields. And this allows us to encapsulate everything that is relevant to the blur kernel, so which is different from image to image, uh, away from everything which is independent of the blur kernel. So that's a, that's a clever bit. We encapsulate everything that is blur kernel and therefore image dependent. So every image has a different blur kernel from everything that is independent of the blur kernel. Okay. Um, anyway, so there's a way to generate synthetic blur kernel because we need to generate training data. And then we have two benchmark data sets. Here you can see the effects. This is after the first model stage, you see the image, the dominant blur has been removed, but there is a lot of ringing artifacts and noise remaining. And then the further model stages clean these up because this is much closer to a denoising problem than a to a deblurring problem. So the model works very well once it can latch onto edges. Uh, this is performance numbers on one benchmark data set matching the performance of the Bayesian model. Uh, again, a monotonic improvement over the cascade stages. This is a, a real world benchmark data set of, uh, from the Tübingen lab. Uh, and this is an improvement over the best existing method at that time. So across all, almost all combinations of images and blur kernels we improve. And uh, yeah. Um, finally, two more minutes, right? Uh, we applied this very recently to demosaiking, which is a problem every di digital camera has to solve. So or almost every digital camera, every camera you can probably buy for less than a 200 pound um, has to solve the demosaiking problem. So there's a color filter in front of the sensor. And you get basically, for each pixel, you only get a measurement in a certain wave spectrum, so either reddish, greenish, or bluish uh, measurements. But you want to actually have three measurements per pixel, so you can have a color per pixel, right? So you somehow need to do, uh, you need signal completion. You need to complete, for the red pixel, you need to complete the blue and green channel. Um, OK, most academic papers actually design it wrongly. Uh, they design it already in a color space like sRGB, which could only be produced after some transformations which already need all three color channels. So we were surprised to find that more than half of the academic papers on the demosaicing problem are completely removed from reality and work on a completely artificial application. Um, so this is actually a real demosaicing method, uh, the, probably the best existing ones. Uh, this is a MATLAB demosaicing method, and this is our demosaicing method, and in terms of removing color tinting in high frequency areas like this, uh, we are much doing much better. And we also handle noise, integrated noise and demosaicing, denoising and demosaicing simultaneously. And we get a, uh, an 0.5 decibel improvement over the uh, existing state of the art, which is visually, as you can see, clearly visible. Um, okay, and I guess uh, that's it. Thank you very much.